attention at this late hour of the day, but it's not going to be that difficult because, of course, our next speaker uh, coming all the way from Australia <laughs> is uh, Pippa Norris, who needs all, no introduction, really. Um, as most of us know, she's taught at Harvard for more than a quarter of a century. She's now currently the ARC Laureate Fellow and Professor of Government and International Relations at the University of Sydney. Uh, and a number of other titles. Pippa, I'm not going to give them all because time is short, but we're really anxious to hear what you have to say, and we appreciate you joining us from across the world. So without any further ado, Pippa Norris. So it's marvelous to be with you. And I do apologize for the fact that uh, this is late, and I'm holding you from your drinks and your dinner. <laughs> But nevertheless, I hope that we can have a good conversation. I managed to listen to a little bit of the previous uh, discussion on the Facebook Live channel. So I've been following along. And of course, lots of good friends are in the audience. So what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about the new book. And this is a book which I've done with Ron Inglehart, Cultural Backlash. And it came about because we did a very short blog in the Washington Post in, I think it was March 2016. And I thought it was kind of common sense, but immediately everybody took off on the parallels between Europe and Trump. And then it went uh, viral. And then we wrote a paper uh, in, again, Ipsa 2016. But the book has really expanded. It's an enormous book now. If I was to show you the manuscript, it's uh, very large. And this is basically a summary. So what's it about? Well, first, what I'm going to do is pick up on some of the points that the previous panel talked about, the actual concepts. And I'd like us to rethink some of these and to abandon some of the wor words that we have often used, like radical right, extremist right, or even anti-democratic. And I'm going to suggest that what the new concept is really about is a linkage between populism and authoritarianism. And authoritarianism is a classic concept that goes right back, after all, to Eric Fromm's work of the 1940s, to the authoritarian personality. So it has roots in the profession and it helps us to understand the contemporary patterns. Then I'm going to talk about the steps in the cultural backlash theory. And obviously in a short talk, I can't expect to go through them all, but I'll give you the basics of how we see the explanation about why now and why there's a rise of authoritarian populism in countries around the world, but particularly in Europe and the United States. I'll then classify European parties along the lines of the concepts using CHES data, and then give some European evidence about how powerful these particular appeals are in the electorate across Europe and in the United States at predicting support for these types of parties and uh, the conclusions. So this is what the book looks like. And it's in bed now with Cambridge. It'll be out in the fall, if we're lucky, at APSA, if not slightly later. So I'm going to give you a little bit from the introduction, the first two chapters, and then just a smidgen from different parts of the rest of the book, but obviously not going into the vast bulk of the detail, um, which uh, it, it goes on at great length. So what's the concepts? So we know about the idea of radical right, and that's what I wrote a book about um, some time ago now, 10 years ago or more. But obviously it's become more exciting and more interesting through the rise of Donald Trump, but also Brexit in the UK, but also all the other parties. And there are very strong linkages across all of these. But I think we do need to rethink the ideas. And our language using words like radical right doesn't help to clarify what this phenomena is about. This is a little snapshot of how the particular parties that we classify as authoritarian populist have changed in their votes and their support from 1945 to, to the most recent years. And you can immediately see that the parties are ones in the lower house of parliaments that were very fringe throughout the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. So these are parties which were like the National Front or the BNP or other remnants of post-fascist parties after the war. What changed, and this is an important period to think it through, is from the 1980s onwards. So right now, we estimate that across 32 developed democracies, Western societies, we're talking about parties which have, on average, about 12% of the vote. They're still minor parties, but as we can see in many countries, such as in Italy, such as in Austria, such as in Germany, that is critical for the balance of power. And that means that they can disrupt party competition and really make headway on their policy issues. 
And this is what the map looks like if we take these parties across Europe just in the last period since the turn of the century. And it's a percentage of vote. And what you can immediately see is the interesting fact that these parties have taken off in the north, for example, in Norway, in Sweden, in the most affluent welfare country, societies in the world, like the Netherlands, as well as in certain countries in uh, the south, as well as in a variety of other countries in Central and Eastern Europe. So what's the definition? And then how do we measure this? Well, like you've been talking about, we argue that populism is a form of rhetoric, and it essentially has just two components and no more than two. So we do differ from Kasmud and various others, but we say basically it's number one anti-establishment. We all know that. It's about uh, denigrating elites, whether they're scientists and experts, whether they're intellectuals, established politicians, parties, governments, capitalists, corporate America, etc. All of these are seen as corrupt and not just wrong in a practical sense, but also morally wrong, morally corrupt. And secondly, the claim is, of course, if legitimate authority does not lie in the elites, it lies with popular sovereignty, vox populi, and therefore the rightful decisions are based on majority rule and popular sovereignty. And this, I think, is most clearly shown, particularly in Brexit, where there's all sorts of issues about how close that referendum was, 48 to 52. Nevertheless, every time anybody says, should we have another referendum? Should we question the outcome? Everybody says the people have decided, meaning 52% of the, of the British population. So in theory, this can be a, a movement and a rhetoric that just justify expanding powers to the ordinary citizen, to average people, to people who've been neglected through things like referendum, popular rallies. Think about the way that Trump, for example, always goes on about his numbers, whether they're on the mall or whether they're in rallies or whether they're in opinion polls, when they, they look as though they're good for him. But the danger, of course, is that this, this is like a barnacle and it affixes the rhetoric to a rock. So the real question is, what are the values which are really driving the policies, the programmes? Populism doesn't say what to do. Populism is about a philosophy of governance. It's about a meta. It's about how power should rule. So we think that what we need to think about is not just this, but go back to the ideas of authoritarianism. And authoritarianism as a concept was always associated with the authoritarian personality. We don't use it in that way. The way that we're using it in the book is very much about groups and tribes. Tribes are sticky. They're how you belong. They're who you're part of your group, which can be defined in many, many ways by nation or by ethnicity or by religion or by gender or by age or by community. Lots of different ways in which we can identify with tribes. And the three core elements of authoritarian values are number one, security. This is critical. And it's been around as a concept ever since the earliest studies of authoritarian, uh, for example, the support for fascism and Bolshevism. So it's the importance of protecting the tribe against perceived risks of instability, of disorder, of women coming, uh, of, of people coming to steal our women, of, of people who are going to steal our goods. The idea that trade is unfair and we need to protect ourselves from all of that. So tribal protection. Secondly, as a result, because you're under threat, because your norms are being changed, potentially by outsiders, you're critical of outside groups and you want to have conventionalism. Conventionalism to whatever those norms are within your tribe. Now, in many ways, they're often seen as traditional norms, particularly when the threats are seen to come from those with different norms, different races or ethnicities or Islamophobia, misogyny, homophobia, anti-Semitism. But basically, it can also be norms within progressive movements. For example, if people are intolerant of those who don't go along with certain progressive values. So it's security is number one. Conventionalism is number two. And thirdly, both of this leads to a logic which says there should be loyalty and obedience towards the leader who's going to protect the tribe. The person who can stop the threats, the person who can reinforce the norms which are seen as morally right within that group. So if you add authoritarian values to populist rhetoric, 
The danger is that populism unlocks the door to all the protections which are there in any liberal democracy. It says, liberal uh, so legislators you can't trust, your representative won't act for you, parties are corrupt, people in DC are all out for themselves. So, a strongman leader claiming to speak for the people and promote authoritarian values is a very powerful appeal, which is clearly personified, I'd argue, in many, many parties, and of course in Trump, but in many other phenomena as well, social movements and so on. Now, it's not just anti-democratic. I think this is a mistake. And again, I think it's a mistake we make in the West because we are trying to understand these phenomena, particularly in Central Europe. So we call them anti-democratic. But that's because it's rather like we know what democracy is and so it's not us. But authoritarianism is not simply anti-democratic. It has a whole range of other things within it, which I think are really critical to understand why people believe in the strongman leader. And nor is it simply illiberal, illiberal. That's part of it. But really, it's not central. Authoritarianism can be there for how you feel about different groups, about your social reactions, about your community, about many things. Now, just to qualify, not all populists are authoritarians by any means. And so we also have the phenomena of libertarian populists, and they're exemplified by Podemos, potentially by the Five Star Movement, but also by some of the movements in Latin America. And not all authoritarians are populist. Uh, look at the election in Russia right now. Putin is making a couple of populist claims. He's going to boost salaries and he's going to strengthen defence. Uh, but he hasn't been campaigning. And actually, he can rely upon coercion, clientelism, corruption, and all the other mechanisms he has to control the state. So how do we understand and explain the phenomena? Comprehensive explanations in the past, and this is work by Herbert Kitchelt, and part of my previous book, have three main elements. On the one hand, the institutional context, the rules of the game. Think about electoral systems and what threshold there is to translate votes into seats. Think about the role of the Electoral College in America. If we hadn't have had that, if the presidency had been determined by the popular vote, then we wouldn't be having this conference today. We wouldn't be writing this book about Trump. <coughs> Secondly, in the, in the market model, you've got demand side factors. These are things in the mass electorate, in the public, in their values, in their attitudes, whether it's dissatisfaction with existing politicians or attitudes towards uh, social conformism. And then you also have supply side factors in the marketplace, which are the incentives for parties and for elites. For example, after the German elections, would Angela Merkel um, have the AFD as part of her coalition? Or would you go for a grand coalition which excluded them, but allowed them thereby to become the opposition party in the Bundestag? So all of these interact, and often we focus on one, but not all three. But how do they interact? So let me give you our model about how we think the process works. And this is our core theory, shown heuristically, just as a diagram, that we expand throughout the book. So we call it a cultural backlash framework. And what we do is we divide up the process into three. The first stage is about social values, about culture, about what people believe. And the first part of the book starts from the theory that we all know so well from Inglehart of the silent revolution. The argument is that certain broad sociological structural changes have been transforming society, and particularly generations, so that as the younger generation grows up in more affluent societies, as they have a welfare state, as they have higher income, then that generation is going to have more socially tolerant, more post-materialist, more socially liberal values. And that's a long-term process as the older generation dies out, as the younger generation comes into the electorate, which transforms the culture in affluent countries. Education is equally a second building block, just as profound, just as transformational, particularly college education, and the proportion of those who've gone to college, which reinforces the generational effects. Thirdly, changes profound in sex roles and gender identities and gender equality, a tremendous revolution in our time, social diversity, 
which is not simply immigration, because now, of course, societies are more open to a variety of different forms of uh, race and language and nationality. And urbanization, something which we kind of ignored in the past, but again, transforming every country as people move from provincial uh, peripheral areas, to use the classic phrase, to the towns and the cities, largely to pursue the college education and settling there. So first is the structural changes. That leads to the silent revolution. And again, I won't go into that because you're so familiar with all of that argument. And remember that the first book which Inglehart wrote on that was observing the changes in the 60s and 70s amongst the younger generations, demonstrating in New York, in Washington, in London, in Tokyo, with new sets of post-material values. But what the Silent Revolution book and what Inglehart's work in the past has never really thought about in a serious way are the losers from that process. We've always thought about it as progressive. We've always thought about it as the world is going in a certain direction and that, because of our own values as scholars, is often seen as fairly positive. But what about those who've been left behind? What about those who do not share those values, who find them immoral, who find trends of gay marriage, who find changes in women's roles, who find the threats uh, from permissive values on drugs, and a whole range of other attitudes to be something which threatens them. So what we say is that certain social developments, which are period effects, are likely to change that. And all three of these factors are going to lead to a tipping point or a cultural backlash. Now, what do we mean by tipping point? This is really important. Tipping points exist in many different phenomena. And the idea is it's not simply a long-term secular linear change. Instead, a group that was predominant, 60%, 70% of the population, a set of values that was predominant, and the attitudes and beliefs that go along with that have been in steady decline. At a certain point, they become the new minority. And we're most familiar with that in terms of, for example, racial diversity and ethnic diversity in America. But we can also think of this in cultural values as well. So in many ways, what we're arguing is that the silent revolution of the 60s and 70s, the new values of the millennials and the Gen X is pushing against the values of the social conservatives. And again, when they were the majority, that wasn't necessarily a substantial problem for them. They didn't feel under threat. But when that group now feels that they are become the minority, not yet a small minority, not yet 10%, not yet 15 but around the 45% kind of level, when things have just tipped, that's when you get this backlash. And it activates and mobilizes those who feel angry that the values around them, whether they're in Britain and Europe, or whether they're in America, have really been lost. And the things which they thought were important, like religion, like patriotism, like family and marriage, are no longer the values which are being depicted in the media, in Hollywood values, no longer being represented in legislatures, because legislatures, by and large, despite the fact of having a diversity of views, often have very liberal and well-educated representatives who are not going to go back on issues of sexism or racism necessarily. And so they feel that they're not being represented, and therefore that's a potential for being activated by parties who feel that they can make political gains through this and that they can articulate these values. An authoritarian reflex kicks in amongst those who feel insecure in their values, amongst who feel, those who feel that uh, conventionalism is vi being violated and that they have a strong leader who can push back, a transgressive leader who doesn't care if it's politically correct. And this is where we then move to the stage of votes. So if there's a strong party, a strong leader, an authoritarian populist party, they can use this as a basis to get their 12% of the vote, 15%, whatever it is. Now, in its turn, this is conditioned by the rules of the game. For example, what share of the vote do you need in order to get seats? And so in the past, for example, in Germany, uh, small parties on the radical right which were, for example, uh, the NPD, they only got less than 5% and they got no seats. But the AFD has broken through and many parties in Europe, by going from the 5% we observed in the, in the 70s to the 12% or so in the 1980s, have actually gained 
representation, meaning a platform, meaning resources. But party competition also matters. And of course, the other parties aren't going to stand still. They're not going to allow simply new parties to take these issues and run with them. And so, as we see in the Netherlands, for example, in the last election, when being threatened by Wilders, Groot, the prime minister, would have a stronger position on immigration. And similarly, Angela Merkel, just now, just in the last few days, when she talked about the coalition, said that immigrants in Germany have to conform, have to belong to Germany. So the rhetoric and the issues and the policy agenda can shift and mainstream parties can become increasingly populist and increasingly authoritarian. And the classic case for this in the book, which we study, is UKIP and the Conservatives in Britain. Essentially, UKIP rose up in 2015. They had a victory in the 2016 Brexit referendum. They faded totally and became irrelevant in terms of the 2017 election. But by that stage, it didn't matter because, of course, the Conservatives and Theresa May have become increasingly authoritarian on immigration and very, very populist. And they've adopted all their policies. So essentially, populism as a phenomenon lives even if populist parties decline and become flash parties. And all of this has an impact then on the third stage in our model, which is the impact on the civic culture, things like social tolerance and trust, things like polarization, things like uh, uh, understanding across uh, party lines, the policy agenda, and things like immigration becoming more hardline, build a wall, etc. And the liberal democracy, the quality of liberal democracy in general, when parties become polarized because of these new political forces. So this is our comprehensive model of how we think the process works and what explains both the rise of these parties and then their impact on governance. Now, I can't give you all the evidence, obviously. Uh, it's a 175,000 word book, which is ridiculously long, uh, but nevertheless. Let me just give you a little bit of evidence and then we'll have a Q&A and see whether you disagree or agree or what feedback you've got. If the cultural backlash thesis is true, Above all, what we should find is differences by generation, which are consistent, by education, the college education cleavage, urbanization, religiosity, race, ethnicity, and sex, as well as by socially conservative attitudes and authoritarian values. So these are our empirical predictors of the cultural backlash thesis, both in terms of values, what's changed, I mean, in terms of votes, and against that, I won't go into this explanation because we don't have time, but obviously this is one of the conventional views that we've talked about in previous work, which is that it's not so much culture, but it's more about the instrumental economic insecurity um, arguments, in which case we should find a different set of indicators that support for these values and votes should be concentrated amongst unskilled workers, those lacking college degrees, the unemployed, those living in inner cities, the welfare dependent, those who feel economically insecure, and those who lack social mobility. You know that argument very well. That's an alternative view. And we do look at it. We have a complete chapter on this. But these are the two alternative empirical ways to think about these arguments. So quickly, how do we classify parties? What we do is we use the CHES data, which is the Chapel Hill Expert Survey, it's a little out of date now but because they're in the field for a new one, but this is 2014, but it covers 31 countries. And as you can see, what we've done is a factor analysis. These ask experts to put the position of parties on 10-point scales in each country on these types of items. So the Galtan, as they call it, has a whole range of different um, values which are classically associated with libertarianism. Are you, is the party pro-nationalist? Do they favour tough law and order? Are they against multiculturalism, etc.? Those are all good measures, we feel, of the authoritarianism of political parties. Mm -hmm. Then we have two measures of populism, and these aren't perfect. And I'm pleased to say that Chess has added a third item in the current wave. But we do have two items that serve their purpose. So for parties, how much do they emphasise anti-corruption? And how much do they an emphasise anti-establishment rhetoric? And then lastly, we have the classic left-right. 
So this is again in chairs, market regulation, etc. Uh, so three dimensions are what we're talking about, not two and not one. How do parties map onto this? So what we're going to do is use those data points, develop scales, and our prediction is you therefore get this type of division. So some parties are going to reflect those types of authoritarian values. The opposite, the antithesis for us are libertarian parties. And we get those who are populist. And the opposite for us is pluralist parties. And then of course you also have left-right. But as we'll show, they've actually declined the left-right cleavage, both as predictors of party and as a uh, policy agenda. Huh. Now, this is really small, I know. So I don't know how well you'll see the image on your own screen. It's also available through our website if you want to look at any of the detail. But what we've got here is the three-dimensional map of party competition across a wide range of different countries, including in the chess data, primarily European. So what we do across the bottom, these are the pluralist populist parties, the populist being anti-establishment and anti-corruption, the pluralist not having those characteristics. And then on the vertical dimension, the ones which are libertarian, which are at the bottom, the ones which are authoritarian in their values at the top. And the critical aspect is this category here. And as you can see, it actually classifies and manages very nicely to capture empirically most of the parties that in the past have been termed radical right, but which we think are very misleading. We should not use that term, because as you can also see by colour, we've also classified what their economic policies are. And some are certainly conservative or right wing towards markets. Others are very left wing, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. So you can see the Poland, for example, is a party which is uh, very much authoritarian and populist in its values, but is left wing in its economic policies. Similarly in Greece, similarly in Finland, and the Swedish Social Democrats. On the other hand, you can also see some parties in this category, which are clearly very right wing in their economic position, but are also very authoritarian in their social values and also populist in their appeals. And again, if you look at the other categories, it's actually rather nice because this classifies, for example, traditional socially conservative parties, say in Norway or in Germany, the CSU, or in Ireland, or in Italy. As, uh, and, and, and Hungary, for example, turns out in this view to be uh, authoritarian, conservative in its social values, but more pluralist than, for example, um, some of the other Hungarian parties. And you can also see that many, many parties are libertarian pluralists, that's in some ways mainstream. For example, uh, many of the socialist parties in the Netherlands, in Britain, in Germany, in France, the German SDP. And also you can see uh, that, they, again, there are conservative and um, labor parties in that category. And we can also see in the libertarian populist uh, bottom, some categories, some populist parties, which are libertarian in their values. And again, the Spanish Podemos is the classic example. Uh, they actually uh, they actually favor um, homosexual and gay rights. And they're also progressive on a range of other issues, even though they're populist in their appeal, <sighs> wanting to have grassroots referendum and wanting to have a, a breakup of the old system and attacking corruption. And Greece, interestingly, Syriza falls into that category. And the size, by the way, is the size of the party. So you've got, in fact, four dimensions on this. Uh, which I think helps to capture the complexities of party competition. Now, let's look at those lists and just briefly, this is what it looks like. And this just shows you the major and minor categories which people are familiar with. The Swiss People's Party, for example, very strong in government. The Progress Party in Norway, in coalition. The Freedom Party of Austria. Uh, the Danish People's Party, all very familiar parties. Uh, there's a whole range of other fringe parties I haven't listed, but they're in the book as well. We've got about 50 parties in total. And then in Central and Eastern Europe, again, a range of parties which are quite familiar. Fidesz, Croatian Democratic Union, law and justice in government in Poland, Slovenia, etc., all quite successful, as you can see. And then other minor parties and some fringe parties as well. 
So what's the evidence that it's values which is driving support for the parties? So what we're arguing here, remember, is that there's a tipping point, and the first tipping point is just in the size of the populations. So let's look at our groups, and this is the interwar and the baby boom generation, and just in the most recent decade, you can see clearly how they've declined in the electorate so that those two groups are roughly 50% across Europe as Gen X has come in and as the millennials have come in. But what's also important is not just their electorate, but also in terms of the population. And you can see that because older people vote, Across Europe, and this is a pooled comparison, the older generations of the baby boomers of the interwar are still just a majority of the electorate. And Gen X and millennials, which have been expanding in the population, of course, manage to stay in bed when you have votes like Brexit. They don't bother to get up. As a result, they're underrepresented in those of the voting population. So let's measure the values of the voters and see whether we can identify the tipping point. And what we've got here is from the European Social Survey, although the book also uses other surveys like uh, the Gallup polls, like the NES, and like the BAS, but just from the um, ESS, we have a range of questions which are known as the Schwartz scale. These are really good because they don't refer to issues like immigration. They don't refer to issues like um, uh, uh, attitudes towards nationalism or protectionism, they refer to your personal values. And we've got things like, do you agree or disagree in the electorate? It's important to behave properly. It's important to live in secure surroundings. It's important that government has safety, tradition, and you believe that you should do what you're told. So these concepts are rooted in the older concepts of childhood values, which go right back again to the authoritarian personality and the social psychological literature, but they've been updated. And these form a cluster of values. And then we also have a cluster of values which are about libertarian things. For example, people who look for new things to do, who like adventure, who like new ideas. So the big question then, has there been a tipping point in authoritarian and libertarian values? And do these predict how you vote? First, these values are very strong predictors of how somebody votes. So again, this is across 30 different countries. In the pooled European Social Survey, 2002 uh, to the most recent wave. And all we've got here is how people see themselves across the bottom on those Schwartz scales, which turns into a 100-point scale, and then whether they voted for parties which are located as populist authoritarianism on the Chess scales. I should just mention, by the way, to explain our methods, that we don't try to predict, by and large, whether you vote only for a populist authoritarian party as a binary cleavage, as a naught one. Instead, we classify all parties on these scales because every party can be populist and every party can be authoritarianism. Education, equally powerful, just as you would expect, a classic cleavage. The more educated with high education in Europe, the less likely you are to be authoritarian. So these are two of the building blocks. This shows you what it looks like if we break it down by country. And again, it's the Swartz personal values, the dominance of those values in each country versus the support in the share of the votes for authoritarian parties, and it's a really beautiful relationship. So, of course, in Turkey, in Greece, in Slovakia, in Bulgaria, very strong support for both. And in Sweden, of course, good old liberal Sweden, the most liberal in Europe, libertarian to a bone, and they have far less uh, support for, uh, and, and France and Germany are in the same category. What about populism? Well, we do see, as you saw, that it's a separate dimension. And what most predicts populist voting, support for populist parties, that's to say those who are anti-elite, anti-corruption, is all about political trust. It's not necessarily authoritarianism. 
So here it's things like, did the electorate have trust in parties, parliaments, a wide range of different institutions, global institutions as well. And again, you can see there's a nice relationship. And again, at country level, what we have is, did you vote for a more populist party or a less populist party? And then do you trust politicians? This has got some outliers, particularly Cyprus, Slovenia, Italy. But nevertheless, there is a strong relationship. And again, countries where mistrust is high, like Bulgaria, are also ones where people vote for populist parties who are anti-elites. And this is a very powerful illustration of what we're talking about when we mean a tipping point. So remember, a tipping point is when you go from a majority to a minority. So what we've done is we've shown you here the Schwartz value scales, how far people support those authoritarian ideas of obedience, of loyalty, and of uh, traditionalism. And we've done it by cohort of birth, going across the bottom, versus those who favor libertarianism, freedom, adventure, autonomy. And we've standardized this, so these are a Z or Z scores, so we've got the mean in the whole population across all of Europe in the pooled survey. And you can immediately see how the authoritarian values have been shrinking amongst the younger generation, those who were born post-1960s. And remember, the whole point about the silent revolution is it started with value changes that became evident with the hippies, anti-protests in the 1960s. And we can see that libertarian values have been going up by these cohorts versus authoritarian values which have been going down. I can break it down by country. And again, this is exactly the same thing. But if you can see, what we've done is we've broken it down. And it actually makes a lot of sense if you look at a few countries just to illustrate that. So, for example, when you've got countries like Switzerland, uh, which is in the top, or Austria, which is in the top row, you can immediately see how the libertarians in red have really expanded amongst the millennial generation early on. And so it was a, a shift that occurred from the interwar to the baby boom generations. But look at the cases in Russia or Ukraine or Turkey, and immediately you can see that although there's a similar trend line, the balance hasn't yet tipped. So in Turkey, as you can see, it's still the black line, which is the, the largest group. The millennials are just starting to turn, but they haven't yet turned. So the tipping point means that those who hold authoritarian values and those who hold socially conservative values are under threat. That, we believe, is what's going on. And just briefly, I know I'm running out of time, but I'll briefly show you a little bit of American evidence. These are some of the trends in socially liberal and conservative identification. This is from Gallup. And again, the emphasis for us is generational change, not individual change. It's not that those who are conservative or liberal have shifted their attitudes or their values or their identities. What happens is that the older generation gets those values and persists with those values. The traditionalists, the oldest generation is at the top, the youngest generation, the millennials, is at the bottom in blue. But as the population changes, as the older generation dies out, as the younger generation comes in, that creates the cumulative value change in society as a whole. As a result, you can see the gaps amongst the millennials, liberals, as a proportion outweigh just the proportion of conservatives and identity amongst the interwar generation, solidly conservative in their social values and social identities. This is again the American data and how people see themselves. And there's a tremendous wealth of data we go through which shows you this in all sorts of issues, whether it's gun control, whether it's support for gay rights, whether it's support and religiosity, or whether it's any other sort of social value uh, about nationalism, patriotism, religion, and so on. And this, I think, is again a very nice way. This starts to link it in to how people vote in America. And we have a moral conservatism scale which has got a range of different issues, which we think nicely taps into this sense 
of support for traditional values which are under threat. So there should be more emphasis on traditional family values. Newer lifestyles are breaking down society. The world is always changing. And we should adjust, disagreeing. We should be more tolerant of other moral standards, disagreeing. So for any broad statements, these will be conservative values, those who are opposed. And they beautifully predict how somebody's supporting either Clinton or Trump. And this, again, is the tipping point illustrated through different data, illustrated in this case through the 2016 NES, where we can see that those who are opposing moral change are strongly related to uh, how far people felt close or away from Trump using a feeling thermometer. So those who oppose moral change are solidly for Trump. Those who are against it are solidly for Clinton. And post-materialism, which is included in the latest wave of the world values in America, beautifully predicts this as well. So it's not just one measure. It's not just one indicator. All of these point in the same direction. Post-materialists are for Clinton. Materialists are for Trump. And this I just ripped from the headlines. This is the most recent Pew. You can go to the Pew Research Center to find it out. And again, the generational differences in approval of Obama and Trump are enormous. Look at what changed. Look at the millennials. Look at Obama. Look at Trump. Those approving plummeted amongst the millennials. Two thirds approve of Obama, the young, cool, hip president, but also the one epitomizing social liberalism. 27% of millennials approve of Trump. And as you can see, a flatter picture for the, other genera for the other groups. But again, Gen X, we also see a decline. So the generational cleavage is, is enormous in Britain right now. It's enormous in America. It predicts so much. And by contrast, just to show you household income, this is again from the NES. It doesn't predict much. It's kind of flat. This is who voted for Clinton or Trump. And the lowest income, in fact, is not the strongest supporter for Trump. They voted for Clinton. It's only uh, the, the, the middle income, kind of 80,000 is the peak for the Trump. But overall, it's pretty flat. It's not a strong predictor. It's only a predictor once you divide it by race. But race is a cultural cleavage, not an economic one. And by contrast, again, the NES, this just shows you the figures. And it's a staggering contrast. 39% of millennials basically voted for, for Trump, 58% of the interwar generation. So conclusions and questions and answers and so on. There's a lot more data I haven't gone into because it's a book and it's a big book. And, you know, I almost drowned in data because there's so much out there and I could have continued to write. But our broad message is that clearly age and generation matters, education matters as the new cleavage. Now, education is related to income, but it's also fundamentally related to culture. Uh, you can't really divide that very clearly, but we argue that it's college education which creates and generates and strengthens knowledge and experience, which all leads to greater libertarian views. Urbanization is important. If you live in the isolated and peripheral regions, just like Rockin suggested in the 1950s, you're much more likely to be in regions which are in economic decline, but also which are aging, and also which have low education. The reason, quite simply, social mobility, the younger generation in these areas leaves it to go to college in places like Wisconsin, Madison, and they stay there because that's where the jobs are. So you're left with a smaller group, which are, to use Obama's phrase, clinging to their guns and religion. They believe that they're still the majority of America, because their community has these values, but they're really under threat by the culture which is expanding in urban areas, which are socially diverse. And by the way, immigration, what matters is not the diversity in your community, but your cultural attitudes towards immigration. Many of the more peripheral regions and peripheral areas are much whiter than the urban areas, but in fact, it's not that which is predicting your attitudes towards immigration. And directly, your cultural values, your support for authoritarian values, support predicts your vote for authoritarian and populist parties in Europe and in America. 
And the change is a complex issue. I don't think we've proved it in the book, despite the length. But clearly, the tipping point thesis is a plausible explanation for what triggers authoritarianism. And it's bigger than Trump. It's bigger than Le Pen. It's bigger than Wilders. It's bigger than any leaders. It's bigger than communications. It's bigger than any media changes. It's social changes in sociology 101, structural changes, which lead to these cultural changes, which lead to these political epiphenomena. Now, it doesn't mean to say there aren't period effects. It doesn't mean to say that the housing crash and the banking crisis didn't reinforce these values. It did. But we also demonstrate that these are temporary phenomena which actually come back after the end of the recession in Europe. So, for example, support for the EU, which went down in the crisis, restores um, in more recent years. Social diversity and immigration, again, the high rate of immigration following Angela Merkel's openness of the German borders has certainly been part of the rhetoric of the leaders and certainly been part of strengthening authoritarian values. But it's not the heart of the issue because your racial attitudes, your ethnic values are just as much triggered by issues of gay marriage, which has nothing whatever to do with immigration. It's just as much triggered by attitudes towards other traditional values, like, for example, religion and the role of religion in the state. Now, populist leaders and parties respond, and mainstream parties and leaders respond. And they, of course, seek to reinforce and heighten these threats. So we have the people who are coming are rapists, etc. All sorts of outrageous claims which are being made, and they're being made by Viktor Orban in Hungary, they're made by Le Pen in France, they're made by... Um, Trump in America. And just on the last word, before we left, before when I was listening to the video, I heard Sherry say uh, populism and authoritarianism varies from one country to another in a way because of the cultural values. I think not. I think it is predictable. I think how strong these values are in a culture is certainly not consistent across every culture. Spain, for example, the Mediterranean is, is very different to Northern Europe. Northern Europe is very different to Central and Eastern Europe and Latin America. doesn't mean to say it's not predictable. And I think there's an enormous agenda for communication scholars to understand and document the rhetoric and the role of the media in transmitting these, these messages. And by the way, in Britain, for example, the role of the media in being anti-EU is fundamental, including the Daily Mail, the Express and the, and the Times, and it continues to be critical. But that is another agenda that we haven't managed to get to ourselves but we really should understand this and get out of an American framework and understand this is a threat which is an existential threat to civic cultures, which is a threat to party polarization and the party agenda, but fundamentally is a threat to the checks and balances in liberal democracy. They're being thrown away in hybrid states like Turkey, Venezuela, Hungary, Philippines, Thailand. The system has gone back so far that essentially we've seen not just democratic backsliding, but authoritarian resurgence. In established democracies, our argument is that there are potential threats, but they haven't yet been realized in terms of major setbacks in most European countries to basic human rights, to civil liberties. The institutions so far have primarily served to work quite well in protecting pluralist democracy. But of course, in America, as my colleague Steve Levitsky and, um, and others have argued, democracy can die. And so on a very gloomy note, we have to say that even though there's been tremendous resistance from the media, we've done a brilliant job from the courts, from other agencies pushing back, from young people on guns, from women in pink hats, and from candidates standing for the Democratic Party with renewed energy, it's not yet clear how far the authoritarian threat is going to do more damage, which cannot be reversed. Oh, and the last thing to think about that, you can have authoritarian cultures, you can have authoritarian leaders, but the leaders can come and go. Think, for example, of Fujimori in Peru, and then the culture can come back, and so can the regime. But you can also have authoritarian regimes. That's to say, when you get a constitutional change 
or a shift in the norms which is such that it can't be reversed. And that, of course, is the most critical danger, primarily in hybrid states that haven't yet consolidated. But all of this is a grand experiment to see how far American democracy is also resilient. Uh, an argument which is still playing out as we write our book. So more details are all available at my website, and I really welcome your thoughts and comments and uh, discussion. Sorry if I went on for too long. Pippa, thank you so much. That was a tremendous amount to think about, and we have about 10 minutes to think about it, unfortunately, <laughs> and discuss it. But I'd ask people to be tight. What? Yeah, a little longer. Are we okay? I'm, we don't have any commitments. Kathy? Kathy? I'll, I'll repeat your, I will, I will repeat questions. No, actually. Okay. Hi, this is Kathy Kramer. Thank you so much for that presentation and for your work. It's just fascinating and very helpful. My question is primarily uh, about wanting to know your story about um, what you say to people who push back about the it's not economics. And primarily my question is, for, I mean, it's very parsimonious to, to show these, these responses with respect to values. But I wonder what would happen if you had measured people's perceptions of economic threat as opposed to their actual economic conditions. Um, if if, and I, in, in your last slide, and I know in your work you're saying that the economic conditions actually kind of exacerbate these trends. So it's not that you're saying economics don't matter. But um, I'm just, uh, I have come around to thinking that it's really people's perceptions of economic threat that are drivers as opposed to their economic conditions. And partly I'm wondering about how the major changes in the economy um, meaning decline in manufacturing and um, just increasing economic inequality, that timeline coincides with the timeline you're talking about here in terms of the generational shift. So I just love your wisdom on how you're responding to those. Did you, did you hear that okay, Pippa? I did. Okay. Thank you so much, Kathy. So what I've got is chapter five, and what I've got is these incredibly small regression analysis with all sorts of controls and all sorts of factors. I didn't wish to give you those because it's painful when I give you those in my, um, in, in any presentation, as you know, right? So I always go for the visuals first. But I'm very happy to share with you in advance what we're finding when we do that. And so what we try to do is say, how far does a range of economic indicators predict support first for values and then for votes? and authoritarian populist values and authoritarian populist votes, etc. And I do agree with you, Cathy, that what's most important out of all of these indicators, with millions of controls, etc., etc., did you work in manufacturing industry, what's your household income, have you ever been unemployed, and so on, the most consistent factor that comes out is subjective income insecurity, meaning, have you got savings that you think you can live by or not? So that does have an independent effect, irrespective of, um, and with controls for, uh, age, sex, da 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 The problem partly though is how subjective is this? So it's rather like those questions which were asked immediately before and after the 2016 election, Cathy, when people were asked about the state of the economy. And before, when Obama was in charge, Republicans and people who voted for Trump said, oh, it's dreadful, da 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 everything's going to hell in a handbasket. And like two months afterwards, oh, the economy's great, everything's going great. And of course, there was a very short, small amount of difference in terms of the actual objective indicators of jobs or, or inflation or anything like that. So subjective financial security is important. The question really, in some ways, is that actually explained by objective indicators or is it explained by perceptions of threat? And perceptions are obviously very different to actuality. And I think these are perceptions, perceptions which are complex to get at we also look at this, by the way, by communities. So rather like you've done, we looked at things like how far does this predict at community level across Europe, um, whether people felt worse off. If your factories are closing around you, if you haven't got growth, if people are leaving, all of those things are important. We don't want to be one dimensional, Cathy. But overall, we, we also find that essentially we think that economic insecurity can reinforce authoritarian values, but it doesn't have a direct effect. It doesn't have 
a, a substantial effect. And I tell you the clearest example of that, without any charts or any evidence, where are these parties strong? If these parties are strong in countries like Norway, which has one of the highest per capita incomes in the world, which has a welfare state which is cradle to grave, where everybody has paternity rights as well as maternity rights and cradle to grave security, then it, it's implausible to say that greater economic inequality or reductions in economic inequality in other societies is going to fix this problem. It won't. Um, it's a much deeper sense of what's going on. Um, and some of the most um, unequal societies in our comparison across Europe, some of the countries like Spain, do not have an authoritarian populist party. Um, they have a libertarian populist party. And Spain and Greece have been two of the worst hit. And again, in Greece, Syriza is liberal in its values, but strong in its populism. So it's complex. And it's not immediately obvious that the economic explanation works at country level, nor does it work very well at um, individual level when you bring it into a variety of models. But it's not without some importance. Sven? Yeah. Yes, if you can speak up, that's okay. Yeah, okay. So thank you very much for that, like, um, strikingly plausible um, presentation. I have a, a short but, but very provocative question. Um, I think um, you, you said that there is a cultural backlash, and I, I'm wondering if that cultural backlash actually endangers the silent revolution, or if populism will die out sooner or later. I mean, that is just the question. Yes. So the answer is, in the long term, uh, yes, we are arguing that because of this change, essentially the tipping point is what catalyzes the polarization. The tipping point is what catalyzes the anger on both sides. So the, as you're a minority gaining, if you're a woman in America, if you're gay, if you're African American, you've gained in civil rights, you've gained in opportunities. So you feel more satisfied with how things are working. If you've had those values and you thought you were predominant and you were hegemonic, and then you lose, that tipping point is the maximum point of conflict, if you like, when people become aware of the differences, and they become aware of the loss. And then, because that group is more active and, and articulate, because that group has a champion, and remember that with Donald Trump, we're talking about 40% of the electorate or so right now supporting him, the 60% who become more liberal also get angry, because they realize that they're losing ground politically even though if you look at things like gun control, the majority of Americans are against it. In the long term, as that conservative group and the authoritarian group and the interwar generation dies out, then liberal values will take over. And we, we can't say precisely that, for example, you know, it's a 45%, 55% sort of balance, but you can imagine that there are various ways to respond when you become more the new minority. So go back to Norm Newman, you become, you could have um, basically a spiral of silence. You could just become quieter. You could jump, accept it once you become a 20% minority because you don't want to offend. You don't want to have conflict. Or at this stage, we think you could have an activism, an energy, an energy on both sides, which is fueled by a leader who's transgressive and who stands for your values. And the fact that you really think after Obama that you're losing out and after the long-term trends, which are all around you. And it's not a false sense of loss. It's a real sense of loss. It's a genuine sense of loss. And again, Kathy captured that very well. We're not saying that it's a perception. Uh, and we're not saying, again, that people are simply being illiberal for the sake of it. They're being illiberal because they're losing status. Um, they've got a right to be illiberal in a way, but it really messes up um, what we do in response. And the last part of the book has three ways to respond. One in a social democrat should say, well, let's put, you know, economic so solutions first. So we'll get job training programs, apprenticeships, uh, regional aid, uh, improve education, etc. Well, yeah, I don't think that's going to work per se. That's just throwing kind of Bernie Sanders solutions at things which aren't going to actually do the trick. Secondly, you can try and uh, change people's values and attitudes, but that's almost impossible. And you can also go towards these groups by, for example, bringing in, uh, for example, restrictions on immigrations which are fair and which meet certain standards of human rights, but still do meet genuine worries and genuine concerns. 
Or you can say this generational conflict is just going to heighten in the short term, and then in the long term is probably probably going to decline. But you know, in the long term, we're all going to be dead. So uh, this is a problem for the next 30 years when we're not dead, presumably, and um, we have to live with this extreme polarization. Sherry, um, speak hi, up. Um, thank you. Um, so I have a question that I think you've actually addressed before, but given this presentation, I'd like to hear you address it again. So you have this great data showing how much more liberal young folks are than older folks, this kind of generational effect that Engelhardt has been analyzing forever. And he's made very strong arguments about how this post-materialism of younger generations in the past has been very strongly linked to democracy. So for him, post-materialism goes with democracy, materialism goes with democracy. Earlier, of course, we had some conversation about FOA and Mung's data that shows that exactly this oh, young generation, no. I know, I know, that's why I want you to discuss it, is actually least democratic, least favorable for democracy. So I wonder if you could reconcile for us in here, I know you've done this before, but the data is striking, how you can have this incredible post-materialism, which again, Engelhardt is linked before to democratic outcomes, combined with, right, this kind of poo-pooing of democracy among younger folks. Pippa, you heard that, I think, yeah? I did, and okay. it's depressing because, you know, it's like out there on the opinion poll, people always quote the one which is just wrong, and but it's kind of dramatic, right? So Fur and Monk, very nice two young boys. Um, <laughs> but they're just wrong in their graph, they're wrong in their data, they're wrong in their analysis. Now. Does that mean to say that Americans are not in favor of strong leaders? Mm -hmm. And has there been some shifts they have? But uh, in our book, we look at that. And what we demonstrate is it's very much a, a sh an amazing shift, actually, between uh, Republicans and Democrats. So there are four items in the World Value Survey that we use all the time to measure uh, support for uh, these political phenomena. So is democracy the best? Uh, do you support a, a strong leader without elections? Do you want the army to take over? Da, 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 da. And when you look at those, the, 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 the big change has been between Democrats and Republicans. Um, and again, Sherry, I'm happy to share the evidence with you and to show you that and, and show you what the patterns are. Um, and this is really very worrying, not, not least the fact that the proportion of Republicans under Trump who explicitly say, strong leader, no elections, what's the problem? That's exactly what, that's exactly what they'd like. Um, and this is in a, a later, a later chapter in the book um, that we that we look at this in some detail to say whether it's whether it, is it damaging the, the civic culture. Um, but it's not a generational thing. I mean, that's just a, a myth, an urban myth, if you like. And the fact that all the journalists are, are sending it around and we always use it is just not credible. And again, I have my article, which is in um, Electoral Studies. Sorry, uh, Journal of Democracy. Uh, if you want to see any of the detail, it's posted on their website. Um, and by the way, in this book, we don't really use post-materialism too much, largely because in most countries it hasn't been measured recently. So we have to shift from using post-materialism, where the, the trends kind of finish uh, around 2000, to looking at other indicators, what we term social liberalism or social conservatism, and those are kind of attitudes towards um, policy issues like uh, gender equality, religion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, I'm not, I'm not wrong, so <laughs> we, we are allowed to differ on some, on quite a few issues, actually. <laughs> he can defend his, but I can defend mine. <laughs> we have a last question, or should we wrap it? Yeah, do we have a last Hello, question? Hello, I cannot hear anything. What's that? Oh, yes. Well, oh, hold on one sec. Hold on one sec. That's it. Do we have a last question? Shocking. You all want your drink. I think I think we are exhausted. Maybe Pippa, that was a, that was an extraordinary presentation. Will give us all a lot to chew on for the next day and some, and many many months after that. Thank you so You're much welcome. for joining us. Can uh, I just give you one thing? You may hold on one sec. I have to plug you in again. Aww. If you can see out my window. You'll see the, the Tasman Sea and palm trees and various things like that. So this is just to make you all heartily jealous of, uh, you must all come to Sydney at some stage. This is where you should be in February and March, not in Wisconsin. Enjoy your drinks. Have a great time. Wish I could be with you. You know, regards to everybody. Love you all. And um, have a good day.